Um, yep, so uh, as Remy said, I'm Alice. Uh, I work at the Financial Times, but you might know me from um, Harry Roberts's uh, Twitter <laughs> <laughs> header image. Uh, Harry's speaking later today. Uh, I look like I'm about to murder someone. Um, and uh, this was the last panel I will ever do. Because uh, it was 70 minutes long, and I was really <laughs> very um, bored by the end despite like being the center of attention, which I obviously love. Um, this is, I work at the Financial Times. <laughs> That's Vin Diesel. Um, this talk is about Git, and I have some uh, humble ambitions. Uh, I want us all to get a little bit better at Git, uh, and I want us to have an interesting 40 minutes. So if even one of those things happens for each of you, I'll feel nice about that. Um, some of you I know might not be using Git. Um, some of this talk is going to be, you know, a bit slow for, the, for you. Um, but it's really, I hope there's still some interesting stuff for everybody. Um, so I think that we could all do better with our Git mastery. Um, but to, to, let's start with what bad looks like. And I've found someone to make an example of. Um, and it is me. <laughs> uh, so let's take a look at some of my commits from nine or 10 years ago. Um, so at my first job, uh, I worked at an agency called Asanka. And um, someone who called Rowan Bainture, uh, who I still work with now, uh, told me that I should be writing meaningful commit messages that explain what I was doing and why, and that I shouldn't put all of my work into a single commit, uh, but break it down atomically. Um, and I thought, that is impossible, Rowan, because my process is try stuff until it works, and then don't ask any questions and shove it into Git. Like, I don't know what, I, I, if I, anyway, uh, since 10 years ago, that company has, was bought by the Financial Times, and so now I still have access to my uh, old commits, horrifyingly, uh, and so I can look at them, some of them, and show you. So, uh, this is the FT's web app, which is nine years old and still, going strong. I know a lot of us work on code bases that like don't hang around for that long, or maybe if you're in an agency, you kind of uh, ship it and then you know don't have to think about it. Um, it is quite nice to be able to see some of my old work, very grounding as well. Um, so here's a commit. Uh, I've added uh, 204 lines of uh, code there, no, 204 additions, um, which might be fine. That could be OK. Um, but probably there's going to be some kind of commit message that's meaningful there. Uh, the commit message is only SQLite stuff. And I haven't even bothered to capitalize the S there. So, But I feel like that's quite mysterious and enigmatic. But it's also, that's not really what you want uh, when you're talking about your code. Uh, here's another one. Um, and what I've done here, this is just the diff from a change. And I've added. Uh, False ampersand ampersand window, so window.history.push date. So I've added that false there, which is a weird thing to do because it means that code block will obviously never run. Um, <laughs> so maybe uh, that's some debug I left in by mistake, or maybe it's um, like a, a hot fix for a, a live issue that I needed to do. But you know, what would make sense is if I had um, written that in a commit message. Unfortunately, the commit message only reads, fixes to download. So we'll never know why I did that. <laughs> um, and neither will my colleagues. And I obviously can't remember now. Uh, that code is not still there, of course, because that wouldn't make sense to leave in production. Um, so that's, that's bad. Obviously, there's like a, a, a sliding spectrum. And that's the, the bad end of bad, I think. Uh, let's talk about what we're aiming for. So as I said, Rowan has told me um, atomic commits meaningful commit messages. Um, so atomic commits are one commit per unit of change. So maybe you've got a style change, and then a white space refactor, and then uh, a bug fix or something like that. And they should make sense as a sort of single unit of code. Um, and they should make sense in isolation. Um, and then your Git history, when you work like this, becomes the uh, story of your project, sort of added to incrementally. The other thing about commit messages is um, that you kind of want a nice scannable summary, which means that when you're looking back to find out why something changed, you can, you can sort of scan the history and, see, and pick out the things that might be useful. Uh, and then also the body of the commit should explain, crucially, 
why you made the change. Um, and why is really important because if you don't write it down, then it's just in your mind, um, and then you'll forget it, or uh, and nobody else will ever know it unless it's really obvious. So you know, my fixes to download thing there could have been uh, fix background download. Uh, there's a bug in the window.history.push state implementation in Android Honeycomb, so always use the location hash instead until that is fixed. That would have been a very sensible commit message for that change, and it would have made sense. Um, sorry, I think I might be doing something weird with the mic here. Um, so in this talk, we're going to cover why you should care about your Git hygiene, um, what Git is in a sort of historical context, and then I'm going to give you some kind of tips for particularly the rewriting history part, which is the bit that I find most useful for, um, am I, for Git. Ignore the man uh, over here. Um, so firstly, why you should care. As you know, Git is a program that runs on your computer, and you use it to manage the process of writing code. So uh, as engineers, we do lots of things to help us manage our code bases. We like bike shared over naming things. Uh, we write documentation. Uh, we refactor stuff. We write tests. And none of that is um, necessary to ship a feature, uh, but it's what we do to help other people understand our code. And, and us in the future, you know, even five minutes into the future, sometimes it's useful to do those things. Um, Git histories, Git commit histories can be part of that picture. So if, you're, if you do your commits well, then they offer unique ways of explaining your code that other options aren't, don't do. So they never change. Uh, they live alongside your code. They're searchable with Git grep. Um, and they allow you to document the change you made at the time that you made it, which is the best time to do it because it's when you remember why you're doing things. Um, and they're also hosting independent. So um, if you put all of your information about a change in a pull request, that's, that can be good because it will help someone merge your pull request and review it. But it's also bad because when your company is like, oh, we're too poor to use GitHub, we're going to move to Bitbucket, all of that stuff is gone. <laughs> uh, I mean, that's a, that's, a, that's, a that's a financial times type thing to do. Uh, I'm, not, I'm not trying to shame anybody else's company. It's the one I work for that would do that. Um, uh, and, and see also um, adding tickets. So if you adding ticket links to tickets uh, in, a, in a commit message is great, because um, it can really help. But your ticketing uh, hosting service, like Trello or Jira or whatever, like that can change. Uh, and also, not everybody has the same access to the ticketing system that you have, and it means that that stuff is just locked away from them, um, and in the future, it's, it's just less reliable. So put all the good things in the commit message, um, and then that just doesn't become an issue. My second reason that you should care about writing good commits is that it will make you a better software developer, which is what we all want for each other and our friends. Um, so. Firstly, and most obviously maybe, you will um, be able to debug things quicker because you'll have access to why this code change was added and it'll stop you from re-adding, um, like re-implementing bugs, etc. cetera. Um, and secondly, and more relevantly maybe to me, um, it, in order to write down why you made a change, you have to actually know why you made a change. Um, and explaining why is, like an important thing to do because it forces you to actually understand the thing you did that you could otherwise have gotten away with not doing. So like one of the reasons that little baby me found writing good commits hard was when I started, I was just like, got to get this feature done, got to try some stuff until it works. And then when it did work, I would like bang it in uh, with a two word commit message that hided the fact that I didn't know what was going on. Um, I'm wearing a, a Smurfette t-shirt. <laughs> Uh, in this picture, which was taken probably about 15 years ago, because at the time, um, I was the only woman in like an all-male <laughs> software team, and I was like, this is some Smurfette shit right here. Uh, and I just was thinking about this, and I just want to say well done to Remy for curating like so many great women that I don't have to wear uh, Smurfette t-shirts anymore, and also like well done to all of us for getting 
better, we're not there yet, but better uh, on diversity, because that t-shirt's gone now. <laughs> uh, so, not working, not taking the time to work out why um, something had worked was kind of me shortchanging myself and, and some learning I could have done, because it meant that I never, like, I skipped understanding why things worked the way they were, why they did. Um, and so it's like it's solid investment in your future to actually think about why a change is like important and why it, it is working. Um, so that's why you should care. Your code will be better. You'll be quicker to debug things, etc. Uh, and also, it makes you smarter. So next up, what is Git? So, did you know that before Git, we were all using other version control systems? So, uh, Subversion, Bazaar, um, Perforce, CVS, etc. Um, Linus Torvalds developed Git in 2005 to manage the development of the Linux kernel. And before, oh yeah, let's, before we just get into that, here's Linus. <laughs> uh, so here's the creator of Git and Linux, two projects that he named after himself. Uh, <laughs> and he has had, oh, uh, and he's had a very big impact on software development, um, which obviously, you know, he hasn't done alone, but it's not really uh, escapable, the fact that he personally has had a big impact on the software landscape. Um, he is known for very uh, toxic, uh, emails to the Linux mailing list containing um, comments that I, I can't really put on a slide. Um, but if you want, if you want me to swear at you, just come and ask me later, and I'll tell you them. Um, and part of Linus's personal brand is that he's very smart for like what I would consider a very narrow definition of intelligence. But he's really <laughs> like plowing that furrow. Um, <laughs> um, and so when he created Git, it was described as a tool expressly designed to make you feel less intelligent than you thought you were, um, which is not, in my opinion, a great design principle, but okay. So up until 2005, Linux had been developed using a version control system called BitKeeper. Um, and prior to that, they were just email emailing tarballs around. Uh, and the creation of Git was a bit um, spicy. Uh, so BitKeeper was a closed source proprietary version control system and there was a free to use client that was also closed source. And one of the Linux contributors, Andrew Tridgedale, decided to create an open source client for BitKeeper because he didn't believe that the closed source um, client was in keeping with the ethos of Linux. So he, he created this open source one, um, but the BitKeeper team felt like this was in breach of their terms and conditions, and so they revoked the free-to-use client and were actually quite annoyed about it. So this meant that the Linux kernel had no client that people could contribute to it with, and so all development on the kernel had to stop uh, while an alternative was found. Uh, two years later, Linus called Tridgedale stupid and ugly for doing this. That's one of his, that's his like more, um, you know, PG insults, but he's very fond of it. Um, so, in, so in about two weeks, Linus creates Git, um, and because he knows a lot about file system performance um, from his work with Linux, uh, he's able to make it really fast, um, particularly over like common operations. Interestingly, and somewhat obviously, the um, version control system for Git is Git. Uh, so the world's first Git commit message is available in the Git repository, and it is this, initial revision of Git, the information manager from hell. <laughs> so that's par party on, Linus. Um, <laughs> So the thing that I find really interesting about Git is that it was a really big paradigm shift to uh, the alternative, popular alternatives for um, source control at the time. So much so that when I started researching this, it was like quite a headache to think about um, the alternatives. Um, I, I was talking about this talk with someone the other day, and they told me they were using Subversion, and it really like shook me because I was suddenly worried that maybe not everyone is using Git and Subversion's actually quite a com still popular thing. And they work at Bandcamp, um, which is like not, you know, and it's not in academia or like an, it's like Bandcamp, that's kind of a, a, you know, a modern company. So anyway, some people are still using Subversion and think it's fine. 
Um, so one of the design choices for Git that was very different to its major competitors is that it is distributed. So it's, that's not unusual now, obviously, but um, at the time it was like really uh, wacky. So what that means is that in Git, you get the whole repository when you uh, clone it. It all goes onto your computer. That's all the history, everything. Uh, in CVS and SVN, when you check out some files, so you maybe check out all the files or just a portion of them, but you don't get the whole repository, you don't get the history, you just get some things. Um, and then in Git, there's no central location that is more, like, structurally more important than any other. Like, we privilege some locations now, like, with if you're using Git, GitHub or Bitbucket, but technically there's no, like, special one. Uh, whereas in CVS and SVN, there is a central one, and you're committing all of your changes to that remote <coughs> server. Um, so the benefits of a distributed system like this is that there's no network connection needed. Um, so for common operations, like committing are quicker because you don't need to push it to a remote server. You'll commit just to commit. Um, also, you can try stuff in private, which I think is a really special thing in Git is that you can you know, have your repo and you can check out a branch and you can noodle around and, you know, if it's rubbish, you don't, nobody has to know <laughs> that you did that. So, and I think that's quite a core part of, of using Git. Um, there's no single point of failure because there's no central, nothing is more important than another. I know it's very annoying for us when um, Bitbucket or GitHub or whatever you're using goes down, but equally you don't really lose anything because everybody has the repository, so, um, so that's good and there's no like, uh, you know, if you're, if you're using a centralized system and the server goes down for maintenance, you can't commit. Like, that's really annoying. Um, and it's much easier to give people access to noodle around. So before, if, if you have a centralized system and someone new wants to join your project, you have to work out at that time whether you trust that person. And they haven't even done any work yet, so you can't really evaluate like what contributions they might make, because there aren't any to look at. Whereas if you're in a distributed system, you can say, yes, take the repo, noodle around, and then you can evaluate whether you trust them on the basis of the code they've written and whether it's good or not. I'm not saying that this is a completely problem-free approach, but it is better than the overhead of having to work out at the beginning whether you trust someone enough to give them access to your central repo. So this all seems like, yeah, obviously this is better, but. It, at the time, it was very radical. Um, so in 2007, Linus gave a talk at Google about Git and the benefits of distributed version control, and he got about three questions that were all variations of, isn't distributed code bad, actually? Um, and the concerns that the questioners raised were that around a sort of loss of control um, and also worries about having to check out a whole repository, which I think are probably valid, and some implementations of distributed version control uh, are less good than Git, and that is having to check out a whole repository in the uh, memory management and stuff, it is actually quite a big overhead, um, but Git's quite good, so. Um, in 2010, Joel Spolksy of Trello, Fog Creek, Stack Overflow, uh, said that distributed version control was possibly the biggest advance in software development in the past 10 years. Um, so you can see how kind of quickly that, that attitude changed, but it was very radical at the time. Another thing Git does amazingly well, particularly compared to its um, competitors from 2005, is branching. So in CVS and SVN, branching is incredibly tedious. And uh, your branches exist in a global scope because they're on your one central server. Um, so you can't really have little private branches to do experiments because you, they exist in the central, on the central server. Um, and they're considered a really advanced technique uh, in CVS and SVN. So actually, most people don't use them. Um, the problem is, if you're not doing branches, then and, you, and your commits have to go to the server, then you're effectively just every commit is a push to master, which is kind of nightmarish for me to think about. Um, but maybe that's just the deploy process that the FD is like, oh, you're just going to deploy that immediately. OK. Um, so it means that um, 
committing because becomes really there's a over, huge overhead to committing because all your tests have to pass before you can commit because you're going to push it right into master. Uh, and it also means revising your history is basically impossible because all of your colleagues will already have your commits, so you can't revise your history because it's already in master. Um, and so everything is, you really can't do atomic commits and you can't do um, sort of revising your history to make it make sense. Um, so, I think I've made a compelling case here that doing version control properly is important and Git is actually really good. Uh, so, why are we bad at Git? Well, firstly, it's hard to use. So, here's the, the terminal. Uh, that's not a very uh, friendly or discoverable user interface. Um, and so, you know, you can't just click around and see what happens in the terminal. You have to actually type things. And then, to, so to work out what you need to type, you need to look up things. Um, there's a lot of jargon. So, Git was designed to be a low-level interface for version control, but there's just a lot of new words in it if you're not used to, if you're, you know, if you're coming to Git from anywhere else. Um, so, including things like you are in a detached head state, <laughs> uh, which even... Like, it's just so unnecessary, that wording for that thing that it's trying to describe. Um, so to figure something out, you have to go to the manual, but the man page for Git is also really confusing. So here is up, um, a common thing that we all do with Git, update remote refs with associated changes, which is the description for Git push. Um, and, you know, that could have just been upload your changes. We don't need all these words that don't mean anything in there. Um, the Git documentation is so bad that there is a Markov generator for it, um, which just, like, infinitely gives you new nonsense Git stuff. Um, and, um, yeah, you can lose, lose a lot of time to that. I think um, there's a, a trope about talks about Git which sort of ends <laughs> like this. Um, Git gets easier once you understand the basic idea that Get that branches are homeomorphic endofunctors mapping on submanifolds of the Hilbert space. Um, there is a blog post that talks about what each of those things means. Uh, there was like, you know, is it, is it really that? Because, I, I mean, I don't know if that's true or not. Um, so it's just to put your minds at ease, it's not that. Uh, <laughs> that's a joke. Anyway, so this is why we're bad at Git. It's because, you know, Linus Torvalds is very smart for a very, or very narrow definition of intelligence. Um, and... He's made something that works for people in that, also in that furrow, and people have worked to try and improve that situation, and I don't want to, you know, do away with their hard work, but also it, the user interface is badly designed. There are many good things about Git, but the user interface is not one. Um, so that is, that's section two. Uh, so it's a version control system created to manage the Linux kernel. Uh, it's radically different, different to pre-existing version control systems. Bad UI. Okay, so, tips for rewriting your Git history. So, what we're aiming for, atomic commits, meaningful commit messages. So, this is the process of writing code, for me at least. Um, I know, I start somewhere, I meander all around trying to work out, and I mean, you know, not for trivial features, but for, for something meaty and complex. Uh, I meander around, I learn things through doing them, I discover new ways of doing things, and then eventually I get to the end. And I commit as I go, probably, but when you work like this, it's not necessary to tell the story of your project to document every single point that you went on on that journey. You can simplify it, um, that, which will make it easier for debugging later on, right? Um, like, obviously, it's important to capture some of the things you learnt because they may be helpful for someone else, but you don't need to capture, especially any mistakes you make, they, they can go. Um, and so, this part of the talk is about getting from the messy bit to a sort of straighter, more easy to understand line for you and your colleagues in the future. So, firstly, we'll talk about git add patch, git commit amend, git reset. Um, I don't know how I'm supposed to say that last bit. Uh, so, unfortunately, I'm going to have to explain some jargon here. Um, in Git, there are some data structures that rep. This is the bit where it's like, it's just a submanifold Hilbert space thingy. Don't worry about it. Um, so, in Git, there are three data structures that represent your work. We've got the working directory, which is uh, in sync with your local file system, and it knows when you've made any changes. Then we've got the staging index, which is like a point 
on the end of your git commit history that isn't committed yet, um, and you add stuff to that that you intend to commit later. Welcome to the conference, Harry Roberts. Thank you for showing up for my talk. <laughs> I'm sorry, I've been, so, I've been so cruel to Harry already. Uh, <laughs> yesterday I said something really rude to him and now I'm just continuing to roast him. No, I won't. <laughs> I'll, t I'll tell you later if you come up and ask me. Um, and I will tell you why I called him that as well. Uh, so, <laughs> um, and then finally you've got the commit history which is your, you know, commit history. Um, so another thing to remember here is that every commit has a parent that it points to, so it's like the history of your project, and each commit is linked back to the previous one. So with git add and git add patch, um, this is like one of the most sim one of the simplest things that I use to make sure to try and get my squiggly working process into a straight line working process. Um, so when you commit something, you have to add it to the list of things you want to commit and this is called staging in Git jargon with git add. So the workflow is like this, git add and then git commit. And obviously, if you're like a badass baby developer like I was, uh, you don't do add, you just do <laughs> dash am SQLite stuff. Um, but the uh, galaxy brain git, <laughs> git user um, is going to do git add. And then uh, patch is what I think is, is something I think is really cool and I use it a lot um, because it means that if you're working in a non-linear uh, way, a way that's not atomic, which is quite common because to work atomically you have to know what you're going to do before you do it. And I mean, there is actually a talk where Linus Torvalds says, and only I can do that. Uh, and I do, <laughs> I do actually believe that about him, but um, most of us are not, you know. Linus Torvalds, um, and so we're gonna, like patching is useful here. So git add patch means that even if you haven't worked atomically um, and you've done loads of changes in the same file that you don't want to be in the same commit, you can patch add them, um, which will give you bits to add and it amazingly calls these bits hunks. Uh, so we're gonna do git add patch um, and that will present you with something like this. So you've got a diff there, which is that, um, and then you've got this bit, stage this hunk, Y N Q S E question mark, question mark. <laughs> Obviously. Uh, so, Y, yes, bring me this hunk. N, no, leave this hunk alone. I did reject this hunk. Uh, quit. S, split this hunk into smaller hunks. <laughs> e, I wish to manually edit this hunk. Uh, and then the question mark, which is the most useful one, which is just tell me more about these options. So if you have a, you're trying to do a git add and you've forgotten what's going on, just question, add the question mark and you'll get a list of what these things are. Um, so that's git add patch and uh, when you use it, it will go through every uh, identify, uh, hunk that the git algorithm has identified in your code and you can add or reject the hunks in turn um, and then you can commit them as your a nice atomic commit. So git commit amend is like the gateway drug to um, revising your history um, because it just allows you to change the last commit. So it's a shortcut for some other slightly longer git commands, um, but it's very useful if you've committed too soon or you've made a typo in your commit message or something. Um, and it will, just it will just remove the last commit and then recommit it. And it will be a different commit. Um, so here, trivial example, but I've made a typo there. Um, so I'm going to git commit amend and then fix that and the shards are different because it's a new commit. Um, you haven't edited a commit, it's just deleted that old one and given you a new one. And I fixed the typo. <coughs> um, so git reset is a kind of, so this is an example where um, the git interface is sort of um, inconsistently designed because instead of having an exact opposite of git add and an exact opposite of git commit, you've got git reset and then depending on what arguments you pass with it, uh, it will do different things. Um, there are a couple of arguments with git reset that I'm not going to cover here because I don't use them, but you know, these are the ones I find most useful. So git reset will just move your changes back through those structures and uh, so just calling plain git reset is in fact the opposite of git add, just sends those changes back to the working directory. Git reset, sha, 
um, will <laughs> move everything back after the SHA. And the SHA is the commit ID, OK? It's not like, it's, it's annoyingly, it's one, another one of those like unnecessarily complicated things, but it's just an ID for a commit. Uh, so you pass that in, and that will reset it to everything. It will change everything after the SHA that you've passed in. Uh, and all of those changes will go back into the working directory. So you haven't lost any work at this point. Um, so you're, you're safe. The dangerous one is git reset sha with uh, the hard flag, which means actually just delete all these changes. Um, so if you git reset sha by accident, your changes will still be in something called the git log, ref log, uh, which stands for reference log. Um, and so you, know, you haven't lost them forever, but they are gone for a bit. Um, so that's uh, the sort of entry level stuff. And if you're not using these things, it can be a good thing to just get started with without getting um, you know, too like, into the scary territory. Um, git rebase is the next bit that I'm going to talk about. So in the last section, I covered small changes, so a reset or a, um, an amend or a patch. It's a very like, incremental little things you can do. Git rebase is kind of a, a more advanced technique. Um, so it allows you to literally rewrite your history because it actually redoes every one of your commits that you pass into it. Um, and you know this is very helpful because when you try things, you learn better ways to do them, and that's very good. Um, so rebasing will replay your changes over a branch, and it, so it just will take a patch of one commit and apply it to a different commit instead of the one you started from. So it kind of looks like this. Um, you've got your feature branch and your master. Um, and if rebasing here against uh, master will just move all of those commits to there. That's just what that looks like. Uh, and then like that, if you want. In fact, no. If you merged, that would be master, and it would give you what's called a fast forward commit. Um, but you don't have to merge. You could still be in this state, and that would be fine. Um, often rebases are talked about in the context of rebasing versus merging. Um, People have opinions about this. If you're a junior engineer or new, I don't want you to worry about people's opinions about this. Um, some people have strong opinions about this. Um, but it's really not a hill I'm prepared to die on. But there are differences um, between these types of mergers. The fast forward one here um, just means that there's no merge commit. And some people like to not have merge commits. Um, the benefits of a merge commit are that if you need to revert a change, you can do that. Um, really easily by just deleting that merge commit, um, and then you've, you've removed a whole feature without having to go through and reset every one of the commits that introduce the change. The golden rule about rebasing is uh, only use it on local and unpublished branches, because what you're doing is changing your history. And if someone else has, access, has checked out your, sorry, checked out, I'm, checked out is like a CVS term, and, and I cannot get like 10 years of using Git, and I still say checked out when I mean. Anyway, if someone has taken your changes, um, you're going to be screwing with their history, and that's going to be very annoying to them. So next up, Git Rebase Interactive, which is the sort of thing that's useful for changing your um, uh, actual history. So rebasing on its own is kind of interesting, but the useful stuff happens with Git Rebase Interactive. So it's going to take <laughs> rebasing and turn it into a very boring text adventure game, quite a lot like git add patch, actually. Um, so here, if you do git rebase interactive origin master, you're going to change these commits here. So it gives you uh, a list of your changes that are at the top there. That's a list of commits you're going to start fiddling with. And at the bottom here, again, is that list of commands that we saw in git add. Oh, it's different commands, but it's the same format, a list of commands in git add. Uh, that you see in Git Add Patch, you have similar thing here, and you can just choose those. And then what you're doing is just creating like an instruction list for Git to follow. So at the moment, pick just means take this one, um, but I'm going to squash these two white space commits together because, uh, for me at least, when people are reviewing my code, I want <coughs> them to not spend any time looking at white space changes because they're not very interesting, unless you're like really one of those white space people. Uh, <laughs> so you can squash those two, uh, and then then for the white space people. They have one commit to look at. They don't need to like find all of my things. Uh, obviously, made another typo. I don't make this many typos in real life, but for a talk, this is like a useful device. Um, so we fix that typo, and we can use the reword option to do that. So once you close this, file git will step through each of the commands from bottom to, from top to bottom. Um, 
stopping when your input is required. So we do pick that one, pick that one, squash that one into that one, and then reword the final one. Uh, and that's your rebase. So that is a straightforward example. It's very hard to do very complicated rebase examples because you, it helps if you all know the code. And obviously, we're not all working on the same project. So um, anyway, so this is about the nursery rhyme Old MacDonald. Uh, <laughs> As, as we all know, Old MacDonald owns a farm. Um, so anyway, for some reason, I've decided to commit the Old MacDonald rhyme. Um, and so here it is. Um, now, I'm singing this to my daughter, who's nearly two. And I'm like, I don't want her to think that only men are farmers. So I'm going to change it to on that farm. She had some cows. So and then I'm going to commit that with change gender and a little lady farmer. Uh, and then I'm like, Mm -hmm. Is cow farming still okay? Am I future proofing this nursery rhyme or is she going to look back and be like, my mum was always pushing meat on me and we all know. I don't know if anyone's seen that Simon Amstel uh, like joke documentary about in the future where people stop eating. Yes, you have, thank you. Uh, <laughs> but like, I worry about that. Um, anyway, so we're going to start farming wheat, just think it's a bit safer. And now I'm like, you know what, I fucked up with that. Um, on the farm she thing because they is the right thing I should have put there. There's a, it, it, it's inclusive of non-binary people. It's, it also like little boys and little girls can also climb under the they umbrella and see themselves as farmers because it's just a singular pronoun that can work for a lot of people. So I should change that. So now I've got my, um, my woke old MacDonald uh, <laughs> that my daughter's not going to hate me for because I have, you know, um, out, like outdated and wrong opinions. Um, so now we're like, I'm like, I'm going to change, get rid, delete that change gender commit. And that's because it doesn't help tell the story of my project, right? Like nobody needs to know that deviation. Um, so we'll remove that. So I'll do git rebase interactive head tilde four. Uh, and I'm just going to delete that commit, which I can do by just removing it, or I could have typed delete at the beginning there, but Removing it also works. And I've got a motherfucking merge commit. Um, and obviously, <laughs> that's very stressful. Um, and so what I'm going to do, oh, sorry, Remy, did you want to take a picture of that? Uh, <laughs> so my merge conflict is scary. So what I'm going to do is abort the rebase. I don't like surprises from Linus Torvalds, so I'm out. Um, so. So I'll, I'll abort, and you can just, ab if you get stuck in a rebase, you can just abort it and you're fine. Nothing, it's like nothing happened, no one needs to know, it's fine. Um, and this is very helpful, and I abort rebases a lot when I lose confidence in what I'm doing. Um, and I go away, have a cup of tea, like get centered, and then I'm going to come back, and I'm going to actually solve the problem. So why has this happened? So we deleted the change gender commit, but our farm wheat commit was expecting that change. <laughs> so here's the diff, which I can find with git show. Um, and the basically Git is going, where the fuck has she come from here? I don't understand this change. Um, and then also the, the commit in C is adding wheat to, instead of cows. So I've got some options here. Um, and Git has presented me with two options. And in, you know, I, I don't have time to tell this story, but I'm going to. Um, these little less than uh, equal to symbols where, with head in the bottom there were chosen because they're not valid syntax in any of the languages that were around um, at the time that Git was created. So if you accidentally left a merge resolution in your code, your code would definitely break, which I think is like a neat thing. Anyway, um, just me. Uh, so <laughs> I need to resolve this. And I'm actually not going to do either of these suggestions because I wanted to get rid of the she, uh, and, but I want to still keep the wheat part. So uh, I'm going to do that, and I may have to do some more merge uh, conflict resolutions further down the line, but that's because I'm trying to eradicate that she pronoun entirely. So then I can do git rebase continue, and that is me. Um, so I've single-handedly uh, saved the planet, destroyed the gender binary in a two commit messages, uh, while also overcoming a merge conflict and maintaining a clean Git history, which is pretty great. Um, so that's my, <laughs> that's my straightforward rebase example and my slightly less straightforward rebase example. And that comes to the end of the Git history management lesson. Um, so Git add patch to help you iron out any messy working processes. Git commit amend to like, change your, like the last commit you did, git reset to undo things, and git rebase to redo things from the history. So what we have covered 
is why you should care about Git, and that's because you're going to be smarter, but also I suppose it'll um, make you faster at working, uh, and it will help your, the health of your code base. Um, what is Git? Well, it's a tool with a difficult user interface that has some really impressive engineering going on, but unfortunately the UI is sort of inescapably complicated and bad. Um, and then some tips for rewriting your Git history, and there weren't very many tips, right, because it's actually, you don't need a lot, like this is, we don't need to understand the um, Hilbert space <laughs> to understand Git. Uh, and actually understanding the Hilbert space won't help you understand Git. Um, so that's that. Um, and hopefully with this kind of, with these tools you can get from squiggly mess to uh, squiggly straight line. Um, thank you very much. Uh, coming, here are some links as well. <laughs>